Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the main stage at Event Tech Live. Um, the next session, I suppose, is, is quite unique. There is no formal presentation being delivered. This is an open Q&A session with a very, very well-known figure within the events industry. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to Event Tech Live and to your main stage today from Event Manager Blog and more recently rebranded Event MB, please welcome Julius Solaris. And just to give you a bit of housekeeping before we get things underway with Julius, we do have some roaming microphones, so if anybody in the audience has a question they would like to ask directly to Julius, please put your hand in the air and we'll come to you with a microphone. You can also submit your questions via Twitter and the Event Tech Live app. So Julius, over to you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Great. So. First time I do an Ask Me Anything question. So <laughs> I'm going to see um, and get questions to come. So first of all, let me uh, thank you, Adam, Paul, Michelle, for welcoming here. It's my third year at um, Event Tech Live and Event Technology Awards. I've seen it growing. I mean, it's amazing how it's buzzing. It's great to have event technology a year. I see a lot of friends in the audience, which kind of scares me because they're going to ask very tricky questions. I'm looking at you. Uh, so of course, yeah, we have the first questions. Here we go, Julius. Uh, if All I right. could put the question to you from, from Glissa. Yeah. Uh, how does Europe compare to the US when it comes to event tech innovation? All right. Um, I would usually answer very different, differently to this question, to be honest. Sorry, it takes a while to get used to the accent. It's weird, isn't it? But you know. After all, you got your coffee, right? You're good, good with coffee. Thank God we're not at 9 a.m. So um, last week I was at the European uh, Best Event Award. And before the event, I had a completely different perception of what was going on in uh, Europe versus the US. We always look at the US with a lot of sort of reverence and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, grass is always green on the other side type of thing. I was quite amazed to see the level of advancement that Europe has uh, in terms of campaigns. A lot is happening a lot with uh, corporate events, um, great projects with virtual reality, projection mapping. So I believe that there's no real main difference. There are ideas and there are people that are really good at doing ideas and creating experiences. And that's what the business is about. So is there a different country-wise? Probably in terms of structure and system that supports these types of projects. Yeah, a little bit, but great ideas are bound, bound, don't have any boundaries, so I wouldn't say so. Okay, um, the next question that we've got up there, um, well, in fact, I'm going to go to the third one down, because I think this ref references your, uh, your session that you did for the Talking Events podcast a couple of months ago, when you said right. that event Wi-Fi is as important as the toilets, are you seeing event planners prioritizing good Wi-Fi yet? It's a bugbear amongst a lot of people, Julius. And that sort of tells you a story about the elevation of content that we put out, out there. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's true. Uh, I've been saying it for the past few months. Um, Wi-Fi is a problem of 2004. It's not a problem that we need to have today. Um, I was witnessing a great conversation in Las Vegas uh, from one of the biggest sort of uh, representative of the hotel industry. And he was saying, you know, he was talking, explaining to event planners how hotel work, how venue works. And, and, and he was saying, you know, what you event planners have to understand about us, hotels, and the Wi-Fi, is that we have a business to run. And I was like, what about ourselves? Are we playing? Are we not running a business? Are we not in the business of making people happy by creating experiences? I mean, you cannot come to us and sell Wi-Fi as a problem, as something that we need to buy. But then they say it's like a utility, it's like water. But we don't pay for water. Why do we have to pay for Wi-Fi? So Wi-Fi is a big enabler to technology. A solid Wi-Fi is needed today. And we cannot ex accept excuses from venues anymore when it's not working. Or, you know, we need to at least cater for that for our attendees and making sure that we, that we have at least what we call soft Wi-Fi to actually produce an environment where people can interact and engage with apps, if that answered the question. So okay. are they prioritizing it yet? Going back to the question. 
Um, yes, they are realizing the importance of Wi-Fi. We are bored as event professional to keep getting from our attendees that Wi-Fi is not working, Wi-Fi is not working. Like, why do we have everything in place and we're so sort of uh, concentrated with the smallest detail of our, de of our event, our center centerpiece, our security, and then it comes to Wi-Fi and technology and we forget about it. That's a perception that is growing in the event industry, thank God. Okay, let's go to the, uh, the second question down on our screens at the moment. Uh, oh, sorry, they're, they're, they're flicking around. The third question down. What best case practice have you seen of tech supporting meaningful delegate networking? Networking, ah, oh, that's a good one. Uh, the best case, I won't make any specific name right now. The one I'm most excited about right now, it's beacons and the use of beacons, to be honest. I'm excited about that. Uh, why am I excited about it? Because I don't necessarily have to do take actions with my mobile to actually get relevant content, content and contacts on my app. The way beacons work is by means of connecting me with the other beacon indirectly. So I don't have to pull up my phone and search for attendees. It's automatically com coming to me. And it's a signal that beacons are really strong. We were doing a startup competition at IMAX uh, in Las Vegas, and the winner was a beacon-powered networking solution that everybody in the industry found to be really relevant. So look at beacons as one of the solutions to improve networking. Uh, just to draw everybody's attention uh, to the screens and to the live questions that are coming in via the Event Tech Live app and via our Glissa feed. If you want to participate and submit a question, use the URL in the top right-hand corner of the screen. And as you can see, people can also vote and show their likes for various questions and they get moved up the board. So um, let's look at number four, Julius. Do you expect the industry to consolidate? Now, I presume this means the event technology industry specifically. Uh, consolidate as in how? In terms of technology coming together, probably, I guess. Um, yes, that's the trend. That's what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, a lot of event professionals are tired to use one app to do one thing. We want one app that does a lot of things. That obviously creates some new assets of problems in terms of um, you know, managing, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. But at the end of the day, we cannot export the data from registration into the event app, and probably we don't have the same fields, and then it becomes a nightmare. We want consolidation of event technology as much as possible. If we don't have one app that does everything, at least choose those apps that have way to integrate with other apps. So apps that offer APIs and, and as such. So apps that talk to each other. If your app just talk to itself, leave it to itself because it's gonna be a giant problem. Well, on that subject then, let's look at the question that's now at the top of the, uh, the Glissa leaderboard. What is the best multi-purpose event app out there? This is putting you on the spot massively. Is there of an course. honest question, uh, answer uh, to this question? Of course, I'm not going to make any names, but um, what is the best app right now? I can give you an exact description of what it looks like. It's an app that it's reliable, it has a great customer experience. It offers a multi-device experience as well. So it's not just something that it's relegated to your mobile. It has a great desktop uh, version as well. Um, it integrates with a lot of services. Probably even if it doesn't offer a lot, it integrates with a lot. And that's key uh, at this moment in time. So when you're choosing the right type of app, think about how much work you will have to do in terms of integration. So choose something that integrates and does a lot of the systems that bring value to your event. We're moving that on nicely then from an app. Did I dodge it, dodge it right? Yeah. Good dodging. Yeah, I think you've dodged the bullet. Uh, dodged the bullet. This side is much fuller than that side. What is happening on that side? Come on, guys. <laughs> ask more questions. Do we have any questions from the floor? Anybody who would actually like to ask a question rather than going through Yeah, can we have some questions the Anybody who wants as well? to, to bite yeah. the bullet and put their hand yeah, in there? You yes. see? James Morgan there. from Event Tech Lab. Uh, you talked about hi, James. Uh, hi Julius. Uh, you talked about um, consolidation and apps talking to each other. What do you think are going to be the trends for 2016 in terms of um, event technologies? Um, the biggest 
trend, if we can call it like that. I mean, I don't like to think as much. I mean, one of the most popular pieces we do on Event MB is about trends. So I'm not going to sort of spit on my, on my, on my food. But I, I don't like to think in terms of trends. I like to think in terms of what do we have to focus in 2016? And for me, one of the biggest pieces we have to work on, it's data. But not big data, not buzzwords, meaningful data. And what it means, I was, as I mentioned, witnessing a competition for the best event in Europe. And all these people were pitching these ideas. I've seen probably around 45 pitches in two days. It's been a long process. And probably 10% of them were showing the results, the actual results of using technology and social media at events. 54% of event planners, by a research that we did last year, do not measure social media at all. So that's scary. But what does it mean? It's our fault, obviously, as event professionals, probably not concentrating enough on data. But it's also the event technology's fault in terms of not presenting us data that are meaningful. We don't want a lot of analytics. We want analytics that make sense. Choose those apps that give you data that you can action, data that you can take back to your boss and say, this is what we achieved by using Twitter or by using an app. You know, shooting out there, I mean, a great example I can give you of this, one of the entrants for the award I was at, they said we got 1.2 million impressions on Facebook. Amazing, right? So I went to check their Facebook group while they were pitching. There were 150 members. So what does it mean? 1.2 million can be everything on social media. What I look at is 150 members for a student organization. It's almost embarrassing as a result. So, you know, let's focus on what counts, you know, the engagement piece, the sentiment piece, what is happening in terms of social media, uh, the action, the results that we get, the ratings of the session using the apps. You know, th these are meaningful data to me. Before we go back up to the screen, another question from the floor for Julius. So my name is Rosa Garriga. I'm from MICA. And uh, I read your article about Confivisions, which is a mix of conference and exhibition. And I think the Event Tech Life is an example. So could you say, could you give us one or two ideas on how could, would you improve this event? Um. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that is happening in the event industry. I mean, you go to a lot of conferences that are not just conferences, and you go to a lot of exhibitions that have a content component. Obviously, the two words are colliding. So why is that something that I like, okay? First of all, because, you know, a lot of events do not happen without sponsors, right? And you have to make sponsors happy, okay? But it's about relevance. How do we make that relevance there? So. Despite there is a lot of talk, I'm kind of appreciating a lot of happening in terms of the hosted buyer models. It can be improved a lot. There's a lot of ethical questions as well arising with it. But you know, my aim and the aim for the industry should be how can we identify good, valid opportunities for the sponsors and valid opportunities for the attendees that want to learn more about technology or any type of product related to an event. So we have to work on creating those opportunities and eliminating the noise that can be of, you know, shouting out there and trying to get people in and probably they don't want to come in. You know, we have to work more on that model. Now, an exhibition without content, who goes to that anymore? I mean, probably in some internet marketing, Las Vegas type of thing, which comes from the 70s, you would go there and you don't care about the content. But, you know, if you're about education, you know, it's about education, it's about business, it's about networking. We have to work more on bringing these three elements together. If that answer your question, thank you. Let's go back to the, uh, to the Glissa feed now, yeah, Julius, because we've got some really good questions that, that have come in. Um, let's look at the third one down. What words or what advice, I suppose, would you say to a client on a low budget and a non-event tech believer? So somebody who's got not a lot of money to spend. So I'm sorry I keep referring to that, but I have a great example from last week. And I was looking at judging all these great events. And they were most of them, they were like 5 million plus budget euros. So we're talking about probably 4 million UK pounds. Um, and one of the winners of the overall um, category actually have less than 50,000 euros budget. So, you know, these guys pulled together an amazing event by just 
coming up with a fantastic idea. Uh, probably you've seen the viral online about the candid camera almost of the guy that, that walks uh, into the streets and everybody has been trained to speak the sign language and he can't speak. So it's a great, great video and I'll share it on Twitter later so I don't take too much of this time. But the winner actually had a fantastic idea and that's it. You need a fantastic idea, that's the problem that we have in the industry. We don't need more technology. Because you see, look at this, we have thousands of event tech providers, thousands of event tech, amazing, great. But what we need is a great event first because all the tech that we're gonna use is not gonna help. So a great event, usually, now you have the biggest opportunity of your life because you have social media that is gonna make it bigger. So work on a great concept. If you don't have budget, forget about the technology. The technology will come later. Just focus on a great, fantastic idea, great story, a great experience that is gonna draw attendees in. Let's look at, will Facebook put an end to RFI-driven posting from events? Is this something you've got a huge amount of experience with or oh an opinion God. of? Oh my God, this is a very technical question. I couldn't expect anything else from Event Tech Live. I see a lot of people in the audience say, wait, look, what are you talking about? But um, that's all right. Um, RFID, um, in what sense though? I mean, I actually see one of the best integration between Facebook and RFID at the moment. You know, when you actually have wearables that are RFID enabled, and you actually just wipe them to do actions on Facebook. So I can listen to these sessions right here and go and swipe my bracelet just to like it on Facebook. So will it take it away? No, necessarily. RFID, it's a, by dope, for those that don't know it, it's a wireless way of communicating between two devices, almost simplifying. But if I have a bracelet and I can do things with it, Facebook is a big part of it. So it wouldn't put an end to it. Actually, I see one of the best opportunities. Let's move up to the top of the screen before we go back to see if there's any questions from the floor. Um, best practices, or I suppose, what, what are the best practices or advice on best practice for delivering continuous value for an event instead of a one-off event app sale? Is that here? Yeah. Which one is it? Sorry, At the top of the screen. All right, all right. I think right. perhaps what they mean by that is what rather they, than using it as a one-off solution. On the app perspective. To, on yeah, the app to perspective. use it as a long-term yeah, solution. Absolutely. That's very easy um, to say it at least. Um, think about the process of an event. And this is something that I said on this same stage last year. Map the processes of your event. So we got people coming in at the registration. We got people going uh, to attend a session. We got people interacting with each other. And ask yourself, how can I add value to each and every um, section of this process? That's the key. The way you add value through technology at each and every step of the event planning process, that's going to make the difference. If you just add a little value or maybe some value, it's not going to work. So that's the problem that I see with a lot of app programs. A lot of people choose apps because they need to have an app. And that's not a valid reason. Uh, to actually choose technology. A valid reason is, how am I gonna add value to the people that are networking? Am I creating a problem instead of value? Ask yourself. So the more you ask yourself that, the easier it's gonna be. So for an app provider, turning it to the app providers, how can you offer value at all stages of the event planning process? That's the, that's the new challenge for event app providers, I see. Okay, uh, I'm going to answer the question at the bottom of the screen to whoever has submitted it. Um, there is a noticeable trade-off, I think it's fair to say. Um, Julius, can yeah. we have a truly paperless event? A truly paperless event? Um, I was at an event last week and it was like... Um, I was talking to this lady next to me. She was in her 50s and I was like, oh, look at the app, it's amazing for this event, fantastic. And she was like, yeah, great, but it doesn't work. Can I get the paper guide? You know, uh, can you replace it under percent? Probably, for some people you can't. So think about your audience and think about the technology you're engaging with. Is it really reliable enough for you to do it? Do you have the five Ps of engagement in place? 
I, I like that concept because it really gives you all the aspects you have to think about. So the place, the venue, the Wi-Fi, the people, your staff. Are you pushing the app? I was talking to uh, Mike from Glisser and he told me a web summit, you cannot even attend the event if you don't have the app right there because they push it so aggressively that you really need to use it. Um, you know, the people, the performers, do they use the app? Are they briefed on the app? Uh, and then the platform, the technology that you use. So all these aspects you have to keep in mind. If they're 100% reliable, you can try and work with your audience to get it. Is that perhaps why we're yet to see really and truly 100% paperless events? Because the confidence isn't quite yet there with the technology that's available. People are still feeling that they have to have a paper backup just in case. I mean, I'm looking at some faces here in the audience. They're like, well, we know each other. You know, we're, we're, we're control freaks a little bit, a little bit, right? More than a little bit. We, we, not, we like to have things in control, you know? It's like when you let go all of that and you're like, okay, what is the backup? You know, event planning 101, the first thing that your lecturer is going to tell you, have a backup plan, right? That's it. So are we going to have a backup plan? So if we have a backup plan by means of other technology, probably, that's going to be 100% paperless. But for the time being, you know, let's make sure everything is in place because we know we have to have a backup plan at the end of the day. Any more questions from the floor? You have a question, sir? Come on, you do. Any you questions free? from the floor? We'll pause the, the glitter questions for a second. Anybody with a question? Excellent. Yes, sir. Hi there. My question is around iBeacon technology. Um, obviously, there's lots of um, differing flavors coming out, and um, Google are backing a certain horse, and you've got Apple going down another route. Um, the question really is, is it too early to make any significant investments in iBeacon? Would you recommend seeing what the market does first and then watching the change? Well, that, that's a very, very good question, actually. So did you hear the question, all of you? So the question was, there's a lot of attention about iBeacons. Is it the right time right now to invest in beacons? So my point is, I've talked to a lot of event hub providers, and the feedback was, you know, uh, when we did the event hub Bible, do people know the event hub Bible in the audience? Hey, my groupies. So we do a, a research a report every year about event apps, and we do a, a research of all the providers that are offering more than 100 of them. And we asked them, like, beacons. A lot of them were offering beacons, but then the feedback that we got is not really reliable yet. If you've tried it, you would have struggled a lot. That's the experience I'm getting it. Nevertheless, it's evolving. It's evolving and it's there. One of the things I'm very excited about, uh, obviously between you and I, um, it's, it's audio beacons. And that's one of the things that is exciting me at the moment. Audio. So beacons via audio, enabling device by waves of audio that are not perceptible to the human ear. So you don't have to actually place things in the room. It just works by sending signals, which is quite exciting. So keep an eye for that. Any more questions, guys? Any more questions from Ready the floor? For coffee? Yeah. Otherwise, there's plenty on the screen for you. Oh, yeah, let's go. I mean, I can stay here for the day. <laughs> let's, uh, let's have a look. This one's been on the screen for a while now. Is email marketing becoming Don't ask me the obsolete? First one. <laughs> <laughs> Is email marketing obsolete or becoming obsolete? Is the industry moving away from this method? Absolutely not, no. We just did a, a survey that we're going to be publishing next week with the Good Event Registration Guide. And one of the biggest uh, tools that event professionals to date use for marketing events, well, the first one is, any takers? What's the first tool, marketing tactic that we use for events to sell tickets for events? Question to you. Julius asks, any takers? Any? Word of mouth. Any takers? Any other? What's the first one? Website? Any other takers? Social media? Social media? Email. It's actually early birds. Early birds tickets is number one. So to date, event professionals use early bird tickets to actually sell events. And the second is email marketing. 
Because, you know, there's a great action in terms of what you can do on different touch points, and social media is one of the biggest ones. But when people have to make a purchasing decision for your ticket, email is the, the medium that they trust the most. There's never been a better time to engage in email marketing. It seems like an advertising, but it's like that. So, yeah, come join. Let's fly. Hi, Julius. Good to meet you. Um, any more? Don't ask me the first one, but yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let, let's look at the third question down here. Um, what other industries should our own event industry be looking at for technology inspiration? Are there any other industries out there who are doing things that we could perhaps seek a little bit of direction from? Uh, the, the closest one that could give us like similar examples to us is the... Uh, the, the branding and advertising industry to me because we're very, you know, a lot of events actually revolve around brand marketing and, you know, live communication. And, you know, the, the two words are colliding. You know, uh, there's a lot of talk on how a lot of viral campaigns are considered events when they're actually advertising. There's a big discussion going on. So for me, the best examples are coming from that. Why necessarily? They have a lot of budget to spend, so it's always great to, to get that inspiration going. But um, yeah, it's very close, and we have similar objectives. We have to convince an audience. We have to work with the audience. We have to sometimes sell something. So I would look at that, and it's great examples in terms of what they're doing with social most of the times. They're the pioneers. Any more questions, guys? I got, how many minutes we got? Uh, no, we've got another 10 minutes at least. All right, great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually bring things go back. Go questions. Oh, then. we've got a question oh, at yeah. the back. Question at the back. I'm Andre. Um, I have a question. Earlier on, you were talking about, so either you're going to take a nap doing everything, or you're going to have basically apps connecting together. Do you have any examples of these apps? I don't know, for networking, apps for interactions, apps for whatever, interacting together? Yeah. Um, I don't make any specific names, because if I make a name, then someone from there is going to come and take my life or someone from there. So uh, <laughs> I don't like to make names because there's no point in my position to make names. But I can give you a great example of that. Uh, I was working with an app that had an API, um, an event app for networking uh, for one of the events I was working on. And I needed to kind of integrate it with my website because I was registering people in my website. And they say, oh, we have an API. Yeah, but is it going to work? Is it going to actually provide value to me? Um, it did. It was one minute. They put it on, they set up the API, and it was talking to a WordPress website in minutes. And that's value to me. So look for that time of instant integration. Of course, it can't be perfect. You know, you will need to work a little bit in it. But, you know, if those apps sort of demonstrate to you that they integrate with a lot of stuff, I mean, a lot of big app providers, they're launching marketplaces so that you can get integration with the smaller tools that do small things. So that's the key. Look for the big ones that integrate with the small ones. And with the small ones, they are bold enough to integrate with the big ones. Yeah? Sorry, I cannot make... See me later. Get me a coffee and I'll tell you. <laughs> Any more questions from the floor? And I'm going to move Anymore? it back to the, uh, to the screen because I think we've got one that moves things on uh, and references a question earlier in the session, Julius. When uh -huh. we talked about going paperless, 100% paperless, um, I'm referring to uh, the fourth question down. No technology is 100% reliable, and, and everybody would know and agree with that. Um, how do you explain it to a client who's showing reluctance in using technology because there's a reliability issue there? Of course. But I, I would ask to my client, how do you say this event was a success? How would you say it? How would you say like the perception of the tan intangible interaction between me and this lady looking at me right now is providing value for this lady right here? You know, how do you say that? This is the industry we live in. It's made of intangible things. Okay, so things can go wrong. Probably they will in any event. There's no event that goes 100% right. But, you know, we have to live with that. So what makes the difference? How, how I'm prepared for that? Because that's what we live in. We live with contingency plans. We live about, you know, we, we, our business is making sure that the experience is spotless. And, and that's our commitment at the end of the day. And the same has to apply for technology. So I don't see a technology that fails. I see event professionals that fail in preparing for the technology. That's what I see. Because at the end of the day, you're always going to have a backup plan. You're always going to have a different way to turn and twist it in some way if you're prepared. If you're not prepared, it's going to be shambles. 
Has anybody here, just interested to know if anybody's got uh, an example, quick show of hands, event organisers here, who's had difficulty in explaining or reasoning with a client when trying to convince them to use technology? Has anybody had experiences of that? Would they like to share it? No? Okay, yeah, I, I guess it's quite common, right, to have, especially if... Um, if clients don't see the need or they don't really understand it. Um, and I, I guess that they are very afraid of technology because, you know, event planners, we tend to want to control everything. And with technology, there is always the, the perception that something is going to fail and you don't understand it. So I think the lack of control and not understanding really uh, makes for a... Well, let's talk about good. another subject, a subject I'm sure a lot of you in the, in the audience love. The subject called show me the money, the ROI, okay? So you're telling me here on the show floor, I'm talking to Guidebook and I'm talking to eTouches and, and uh, Lumi and, and so forth. So you tell me I have to spend this much money on your product. What am I going to get out of it, right? This is what your boss or whoever is committing an event is going to ask you. So let's talk about the ROI. So I was at an event and we were talking and someone stands up and say, so we always have this talk with sales and marketing and we want to do cool things with tech. We're going to engage attendees and create stories and experiences and do these, these amazing things. But they come to us and say, so what's the return on that? So who's, who's to blame here? That's my question. Is it to blame the sales and marketing people or us for not coming with enough tangible metrics in place to display that the technology that we use is actually bringing some results. Because if we have a valid business case, no boss is going to say no. The problem is sometimes we don't have valid business cases for using social media, for using technology. 54% of event planners don't, plan, don't measure social media. So don't sell me that social media is great for an event because I have to make business decision. As you know, event planner, you have to make business decision. We have a gentleman here in the room and another one. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, oh, yeah, a question there. Hi, and we've got another question here, sir, as well. We'll, we'll come to you next. Yeah. Just, uh, just to, add to, to add to what you're kind of saying there, Julius, is uh, event technology suppliers, have you thought about linking your product to measurable deliverables? So if you're talking to your client and saying, OK, well, this is what our product costs. Only pay us half for it, but if we do this, this, and this, We'll deliver and we'll measure against that after the event. So, Julius, just repeat that for people so who yeah. didn't, didn't quite get it at the back, please. So Richard was saying, so our cost costs this, our product costs this. We're going to bring you this much more if you use it. And this is what we're offering you. You're going to make money out of it. So whose boss is going to say no to that? I mean, please introduce it to me because I'm going to say you're, you're, you're crazy to say no to a revenue opportunity. If there's a revenue opportunity, that's the thing, though. There is to be a tangible, measurable revenue opportunity. Not we have 1.2 million Facebook engagements or impressions. It doesn't mean anything to have that. What we want is tangible people that engage in a tangible ways with our events. Tangible ticket sales for next year. Can you measure that? Of course you can. Of course you can measure that. Another gentleman here in the room. Well, we, we tend, event tech people tend to uh, flip things around. Actually, you sh should start from the question of what are my objectives for this event and then looking for the technology that goes with it rather than just having the, technolo the technology to fill in the technology. So I think a good, a good way to approach these type of clients is first take in their ob objectives and then see which tools, even if it's a simple one, if, if paper can do the job, then let paper do the job if there's no budget. But don't try to sell technology just for the technology. That's a fantastic approach. Solve small problems. Use not necessarily hugely expensive tools. Do not disrupt your event because you want to try technology, because you want to do cool things. You are in the business of creating values for your stakeholders, for your attendees. You're not in the business of doing cool things, OK? So, Keep that in mind when you do it, okay? That's, that's going to be key. Any more questions? One more there. Oh, my God. Question at the back there. Let's grab a beer after that. That's going to be cool. 
Um, now, just to make sure that you, that you guys take the question on the screen, um, especially for internal events, how do you consider IT? Are they more like people blocking the technologies or facilitating? How, what's your view on the IT yeah, yeah, within a company? A that's a very, very valid question. Did we get all the questions? Did we? Un yeah, did I think we're referring to the question up on. Um, uh, yeah, is yeah, the yeah. question up on the Number screen? One. Are, are the IT departments that we all have to deal with blocking our progress? So, very valid questions. A lot of uh, then technology providers ask themselves that question because obviously they want to sell their product. So there are two ways. Um, um, one is closed networks. They're really, really popular in. Uh, corporate events, so apps that actually has a, have a private environment, you know, that is just within that specific event, so it doesn't go outside. Oh, even for free if you wanted to, so not necessarily costly. You know, just grab, your, grab a copy of the Event Hub Bible, it's going to be pricing as well, so there are free ones that offer that as well. And the second one is soft Wi-Fi, very popular at the moment, where people are fed up with Wi-Fi not working, so they install their own sort of LAN only network so that doesn't go outside in terms of the internet, but in, you know allows engagement within the room. That's becoming really popular now. Is a definite solution? Are we there yet? No, absolutely not. There's a lot to go. More reliable networks, more private networks. I mean, I've been told that in hotels in, in Vegas, whenever there are sort of computer events, they use different phones because they're scared of hackers getting into their phones through the network. So it's, it's becoming a problem for some types of events as well. Are we there yet structure-wise? No. But there are things that you can do. There's not going to be a necessary a school, but they're going to be effective in terms of delivering that. We cover that in the book extensively, so go and check it, absolutely. Julius, we've got a few minutes left, so I'm keen mm -hmm. to get through a couple more of these questions that, that have come in via Glissa. Um, let's look at corporate events embracing, embracing things like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, do you think that there should be a bigger uptake with Periscope and Snapchat and some of the other uh, social media apps that are out there to reach a wider audience for these types of events? Um, no. No. There we go. Let's move no, on to the next because, question. because, you know, is there value for your attendee to actually use a social network? Are they on Instagram? Are they on Snapchat? If they are on Snapchat, you should be on Snapchat. But don't force things into people because they made 6 billion views. You don't have to care about that. It's just news. We don't care about it. You don't have to care about the buzz. You have to care about the value of the experience that you're delivering to your attendees. If the social network you're choosing is helping to deliver a better experience to your attendee, for God's sake, use it now. If it doesn't add anything, you're just trying to be cool, don't be cool because it's going to be a nightmare of graveyards. I call it graveyards. I've seen a lot of graveyards with abandoned Twitter accounts abandoned Facebook accounts with two followers, but we try to be cool. It's not cool. So let's focus on what works, okay? Well, nicely moving on then, let's look at the third question down. What niche technologies do you think will become mainstream in the future? Now, the future, this could be next year, this could be in five years, this could be 10 years, but any niche technologies? I, I'm a big fan. I mean, going back to, to Periscope, I'm not contradicting myself, but I really like the concept of live streaming because we are in the live communication business and it's very relevant to what we do. So it's very close to the event experience. Streaming live the, the, the content produced at any event, whether it's entertainment, whether it's a conference, whether it's a campaign launch or something like that, you need to involve your offline audience into it. We've got a great example I do with Periscope, with the uh, uh, Red Bull at the Miami Music Week, when they actually used Periscope to make interviews with VIPs in the backstage. That's a great use, very complimentary to the, to the core message of the event, without necessarily sort of uh, creating legal implications, because we always think about that. And when we Meerkat and Periscope were coming on, we were like, oh my God, we're going to stream our event. What is going to happen now? Same talk that we had in 2007, Twitter. Oh my God, people are going to say negative things about my event. Why do we have to look at that and we don't see the wider opportunity of engaging people that cannot attend the event? 
Why do we have to look at the negative side of things? Let's embrace it if it's relevant for our audience and let's make use of it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, have we got one more question there before we wrap up? It was just to uh, add to Julius's comment about uh, go where the fishes swim, but uh, also uh, it might be interesting to know that Facebook is currently doing tests on live streaming and uh, that will obviously have a big uh, magnet as well. So that will probably replace or supplement Periscope, but I think live streaming across Facebook will be very exciting for the business. Yeah, live streaming, I think we've seen uh, recently, if I'm right, Match of the Day, BBC's Match of the Day did a, a live um, Facebook stream. Absolutely. I mean, the biggest experience of that was uh, Pacquiao versus Mayweather. Wait, Mayweather. How many people know about that? The boxing match of the century, right? You had to pay $150 to watch it on TV. And then all of a sudden, someone pops up their phone from the audience and start live streaming it on Periscope. So obviously, as event professionals, we're always like, Oh my God, we're screwed. No, we're not screwed. It's about having bigger opportunities and that's what a remote audience is gonna be. We know that by research that 80% of people that watch and follow an event online are gonna purchase a ticket for next year if they can. So let's focus on making selling tickets, not on paranoid thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, we are right on time, so uh, it's important that we keep things moving along and we uh, wrap up today's Ask Julius session. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a warm thank you to Mr. Julius Solaris. <laughs> Julius, I think, are you going to be hanging around for the rest of today? I'm going to be around for a while, yes, and tonight at uh, the awards as well. So if anybody is uh, sticking around for the rest of the day and wants to speak to Julius personally, I'm sure Julius would be glad to uh, a coffee, have a coffee, please, buy okay. him a coffee, and he'll be at the awards tonight as well. Um, coming up... At midday on this stage, um, we've got augmented reality and virtual reality, a practical application for events, question mark, is it? Uh, so around about 15 minutes time, your next session on the main stage. Thanks once again to Julius. It might just be back.